want to continue our series with you this morning in week three of our multi-week series. If you remember, we began this series looking at difficult sayings of the Bible. The Bible encourages us, it lifts us up, it edifies us. We see and understand how much God loves us as we read His Word. There are moments in Scripture where we pause because the passages are difficult. They're very sometimes hard to understand. Sometimes we don't want to understand them because the Word challenges us. So I was led to this series by God, and we began looking at some interesting things. First and foremost is the paradox that faces us in Christianity. Every day, we have to choose to die to ourselves so that we might live in the boldness of Jesus Christ. Every day. In order to live, we have to choose to die to ourselves. Last week, we looked at another very important topic. Jesus went out seeking His one. He went out trying to find the next one that He would share the Gospel with, the one God was leading Him to for salvation. And my challenge to you and God's challenges to us through His Son Jesus is, are you seeking your one? Do you know who you're going to to share the Gospel with? And when God saves him or her, are you ready to disciple that person? Are you seeking your one? Today and next week, we're going to look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the pillar of Christianity. This is what separates Christianity from every cult and every religion on the face of the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I do not worship a dead man. We worship a man who has been resurrected, God who has resurrected His Son. This is the game changer in the Christian faith. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you this morning, the reason I ask you guys to bring the lights up, you will be lost without your Bible this morning. We are going to look at several passages of Scripture as we look at the evidence for the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask you for your patience because I'm going to ask you to go from Genesis to Revelation today. And we're going to look at multiple passages. So you ready to go to work? Let's do it. If you want to take your Bibles out and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the best place to start when we look at the evidence for the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the best description, definition, moment in Scripture where God helps us understand the power of the resurrection of His Son. So if you're able this morning, I'm going to ask you to stand with me in honor of our Father's Word as I read it for you. If you cannot stand, you stay seated and just read the Bible with us. Here we go. We're going to begin in verse 1. Paul says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you're being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Peter, or Cephas, then to the twelve. Then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom were still alive, though some had fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, He appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, so you believed. Would you pray with me? Father, we bow before you this morning and we're so grateful for the privilege you've afforded us to once again come to you as a family. 
corporately. There are men and women who could not be here today who are gathered in their homes, and right now they're looking at their computers and they are a part of our service as well. There are men and women because of pre-existing conditions who came today but aren't able to come in this room, but they're sitting in the parking lot in their vehicles right now as I speak. Father, whether we're there, whether we're at home or here, we need you to speak. So God, I pray that you would bind Satan and his minions from this place and every place where your people are gathered this day. I pray, Jesus, that you would be Lord here now, Holy Spirit. We need you to help us understand this text and show us how to apply it to our lives. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So I have entitled this, The Evidence for Christ's Resurrection. Now there are four things that I want you to gather with me. Four different testimonies as to why the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus is so clear, given to us here in this text. So let's begin looking at the first testimony. It is the testimony of the church. Now, this is not explicitly given to us, but it is implicitly implied. So let's look at verse 1. Paul says, Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, it doesn't say sisters there, but it is implied in the Greek, by the Greek word being used, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand. Paul is sharing the truth with them. If you remember, Paul came to Corinth. It is decadent. It is one of the most carnal places in antiquity. If I were to call you a Corinthian, that would be the most heinous insult I could cast upon you. It is that kind of place. And in that place, God sent Paul and Paul planted a church there. People were saved. The church began to grow. And after a year or so, Paul wrote this letter to them to encourage them, to disciple them, to help them grow deeper in the faith. And so he says, now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you. I want you to notice something very important. The gospel is the truth of Scripture. It is upon which everything else in Scripture is built. It is upon which everything else in Scripture stands. If you and I do not have a clear understanding of the gospel, we are lacking in our ability to be the testimony that God encourages us to be. And so notice with me as Paul is writing to the church. Notice what he says again in verse 1. Brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you by which you received, in which you stand. Verse 2. And by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word. Now I want to just go ahead and put this out up front. This verse is not saying, verse 2, is not saying that you can lose your salvation. Although some pastors in the church today are preaching that that is the case. I want you to understand that when God saves you, you are saved for all eternity. You can't lose your salvation. Now that doesn't give you carte blanche to go out and do whatever it is you want to do and sin before holy God. That's not what God is saying. Paul is saying, watch what he says, verse 2, by which you were being saved, meaning that people in Corinth were being saved by the gospel truth of Jesus Christ. If, there's a condition, if you hold fast to the word that I preach to you. Here's what he's getting at. Anybody can believe that there is a God. I know people who believe that there is a God, and I would be willing to bet so do you. But believing in God does not save you. Are we okay? Believing in God does not save you. The Bible also tells us that even Satan and his demons believe in God, and they shudder. You see, salvation begins the moment you repent. You change your mind, you change your direction, and you move to God. You confess your sin, the ugliness in your life, 
you ask God to forgive you, and by faith, you accept the gift of life through Jesus Christ that God offers. Then you are saved by God. Then you have a relationship with God. And that's why Paul says in verse 2, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. You see, the church at Corinth was struggling in its testimony for Jesus in the culture within which they lived. So the first thing we see of the evidence of the Christ's resurrection is the testimony of the church. And can I just share with you? Your testimony is only as great as your faith, trust, and hope and belief in the Almighty God. So if we at Kathleen Baptist Church are struggling to go out to the community and tell people about Jesus, that is the testimony that they will see. That is the image that they will receive. But when we go out in faith, when we go out in boldness, when we go out in love, and they see that image of God, it changes the game. Second thing I want you to see is the testimony of Scripture. Verse 3. Now, this is where we're going to go deep, okay? This is where we're going to start diving down below the surface. So hang in there with me for the next few moments. The testimony of Scripture, verse 3. For I delivered to you as of the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Notice, it is of first importance. It's not second. It's not third. It's not fourth. It's not fifth. It is of first importance. Is it the case in your life? Is this of first importance in your life? You need to think about that for a few moments. We all do. We all need to take a step back and sit down and look in the mirror and determine, is my relationship with God important to me? Is the gospel of Jesus Christ of first importance to me? Paul says, I delivered to you that which was of first importance to me. Can I just tell you a secret? We talk about what's important to us. We share what we're excited about. Now, I, I love football. And I'm so excited that I'm going to get to see Alabama play football here in a few weeks. I have no clue, Preston, what kind of team we have this year. I don't know if my tide's going to roll or if my tide's going to go flat. But you want to know something? When it gets down to it, I'm going to cheer for them either way. That's important to me. For 16 weeks out of the year, this year's different. But for 16 weeks in a normal year, we get to watch football. My wife and I and my daughter Rachel were watching football last night. Wasn't much of a game, but we were watching football. It's just exciting to watch guys play football again. You see, you talk about what's important to you, and so do I. And Paul says, I'm sharing with you, the church of Corinth, what is of first importance. Now, here's where we're going to go deep. Go hold your place here. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Notice what he says. As you turn there, I'll keep talking. Paul says, the gospel is the truth of Scripture. So go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. We have talked about this before. Let's refresh our memories. It is in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve have just sinned. They have just broken and fractured their relationship with God. Human race will never be the same. In this moment in the Garden of Eden, God has just judged and cursed Satan. He's about to judge Adam and he's about to judge Eve. In the middle of this sandwich, this spiritual sandwich, in this moment in time, God is about to say something that is very important. He prophesies for the first time in Scripture. He gives mankind hope. He could have easily have destroyed Adam and Eve and created another Adam and another Eve, but he didn't do that. He could have easily punted and just left, but he didn't do that. He could have done a myriad of things. But what he chose to do was to give hope when there was none. Verse 15, chapter 3, God says, I will put enmity between this hostility between you and the woman, meaning Satan and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. God is telling us there's going to be a titanic struggle from generation to generation to generation between good 
and evil. He is telling us spiritual warfare will be a major part of the human drama. He is foreshadowing the Bethlehem manger. He is foreshadowing the cross. He is foreshadowing the tomb. He is foreshadowing the resurrection. He is telling us Messiah will come. This is the gospel. And God prophesies the gospel through His Son, Jesus Christ, foreshadowing in Genesis 3, verse 15, of what He will do. And the rest of the Bible focuses on that truth. The Old Testament points to Jesus. The New Testament reveals His arrival. And the rest of the New Testament, through the Holy Spirit of God, Jesus builds His church. Briefly, that is Scripture. And Paul says in verse 3, For I delivered to you that which was of first importance. Here's the gospel. Many people ask me, Mike, I don't know what it is. Can you define it for me? You should circle verse 3 because God does that for you. He defines the gospel as simple and as simplistic as he could. So even somebody like me can get it. Look at it with me. Verse 3, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. Verse 4, that he was buried, he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. The gospel is defined simply as the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can I tell you a secret? We serve a risen Lord. That should change the way you live. It changes mine and my life. And I hope it impacts you and yours. God gives us the definition of the gospel. You want to know why? Because he knew we would have questions about what it is. Circle this, earmark this page, go back to it anytime you need to, because he tells us the essence of the gospel message. And notice the phrase he gives us over and over in this, verse 3 and 4. He says, I received that Christ died for our sins. You should underline this in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day. Say it with me in accordance with the Scriptures. Do you believe the Scriptures? Let's look at them for a second. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I want you to go to verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. I, I told you we were going to look at Scripture. We're going to look at it together. We'll focus on part A of verse 16. All Scripture is breathed out by God. All Scripture is breathed out by God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, God used 40 men on three continents, 1,500 to 2,000 years to write the book that we now hold in our hands. They are the writers of Scripture. But this verse makes it profoundly clear there is only one author of Scripture, and His name is God. God used 40 men under the power of the Holy Spirit to write the words on the pages you hold in your hand. But there is only one author of Scripture. Scripture literally comes from the mouth of God. Therefore, therefore, because God is living, His Word lives. Because God is holy, His Word is holy. Because God is just, His Word is just. It comes from the mouth of God. Therefore, this book cannot be anything less than God is. Are we good? Amen. Let's keep going. Second, I want you to go to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Hang in there with me now. We're going to look at Scripture because I want Scripture to edify Scripture. Very important. And so we're going to let Scripture speak today. We're in Genesis. Are we in Luke chapter 24? The resurrected Lord is walking with two of His disciples on the road to Emmaus, as the Greek is pronounced. And so as they're walking, look at verse... I'm sorry, let's go to 25. Luke 24, verse 25. And Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into His glory? 
And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them, here it is, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. God is the author of scripture. Jesus Christ is the focus of scripture. And the Holy Spirit of God is the source of scripture. Coming from the mouth of our Savior, he edifies what Paul is saying under the influence and driven by the Holy Spirit of God. You see, the testimony of Scripture drives how we live our lives. And so as we look at the evidence for Christ's resurrection, we see not only the testimony of the church, and as the church loves God, surrenders to God, the presence of God begins to move through the church, we see the testimony of Scripture. It all begins here. Do you believe that this is the Word of God and does it change your life? Third, as we look at the evidence for Christ's resurrection, we see the testimony of eyewitnesses. Oh, I love this. God knew I needed to see this. And I hope it encourages you. Look at verse 5. And then Jesus appeared to Peter, or Cephas, then to the twelve. Notice that the resurrected Lord appears to Peter, and he also appears to the disciples. And if you look at Matthew and Luke, you will see many, all of those encounters, in fact. Verse 6, then Jesus appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom were still alive, though some had fallen asleep, meaning that some had died. Jesus appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. This is referring to the mountaintop in Galilee. This is referring to where Jesus told his disciples to meet him. He meets them on that mountaintop, and there are more than 500 men there, plus women, plus children. Theologians and scholars say that there's somewhere between 800 and 1,000 people on that mountaintop that day to witness the final commands of Jesus. What are they? I'm glad you asked. That's a good question. Let's move through them quickly. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, we see the great commission of our Lord and Savior to the church. He said, make disciples. In Mark 16, verse 15, Jesus says, proclaim the gospel to every living thing. In John chapter 21, verses 15 to 17, Jesus is sitting with Peter on the shore of Galilee, frying some fish on the fire. And Jesus asked Peter three times, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter three times says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep, teach my sheep. And it broke Peter to his core because he realized that he didn't love Jesus the way he thought he loved Jesus. And that was the transitional moment in the life of Peter. So today I ask you, do you love God? Are you willing to share the gospel truth with men and women in the body of Christ who need to know the evidence for the faith that they have in God? Do you love God? Do you love the church? And are you taking care of the people in the church? And then we go to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus reminds us that you were powerless without the Holy Spirit of God. And he tells us this, I'm paraphrasing, but look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and you will see Jesus tells us this has nothing to do with you. This is not about you. Never was, never will be. This is about your surrendering to the Holy Spirit of God so the power of God can use you to transform your life. This is about you surrendering to God so God can give you the courage you need to live your life for Him. This is about you surrendering to the leadership of God so God can give you the love that you need to live for Him in ways that you can on your own. This is what Jesus shared on that mountaintop. This is the testimony of those eyewitnesses. Go to verse 7. We're back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 now. Verse 7, the Bible tells us that then He, meaning Jesus, appeared to James, then to all the apostles. You should, you should note this. This is significant. Because the resurrected Savior only appeared to Christians except one time. He went to the disciples, he went to his apostles on all his, of his appearances, his resurrection appearances, except one time. And he went to his half-brother, James. 
I, I, don't, I don't know why, except for some of the evidence that Jesus gives us in his word, that God reveals to us in his word. You see, Jesus and James were earthly brothers. James, his parents, were Jesus' parents. But Jesus was born by the Holy Spirit of God. James was born by Joseph and Mary. They're half-brothers. But all of the brothers did not believe that Jesus was the Christ. None of the brothers in his family believed that Jesus was Messiah. And I believe, according to Scripture, Jesus goes to James and he reveals himself. The resurrected Lord is standing before his half-brother. His half-brother James gets it. He repents and changes his life. How do we know this to be true? Because the book of Acts tells us that James becomes the first pastor of the church in Jerusalem after Jesus ascends to heaven. And he has mentioned pivotal points in the book of Acts and his leadership and his guidance becomes so, so powerful. Soon we will do a series on the book of James and I will tell you more about who he is and what he means to you and me. You see, the testimony of eyewitnesses is incredible. It's not to James. It's not just Jude, his brother. It is also Peter, and it's also Paul. It is also John. It's also Matthew. It's also Luke. These are eyewitnesses that God uses to write the New Testament. So I'm telling you today, you have all the evidence you need in spite of what Satan and our culture tells you. You have the eyewitness testimony of who Jesus is. You have the testimony of Scripture, and you have the testimony of the church. This is where you and I live out what we believe before holy God and the culture that we live in. And fourth and finally, we see the testimony of a special witness. Look at verse 8. Paul says, last of all, as to one untimely born, he, meaning Jesus, appeared also to me. And Paul describes himself here. Listen to the humility of this man. I am the least of the apostles, he says. Last of all, I am one untimely born. When you look at those words, untimely born, in the Greek, it means one who is aborted. It means one who is miscarried. Paul did not see himself in a good way. He was so humbled because Jesus chose to appear to him and to offer him salvation. He is so humble because he knows what he did and how he lived before Jesus revealed himself to him. Look at verse 9. Paul says in verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles. I am unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. That word persecuted, in the Greek, it means to put to flight. It means to make flee. It means to drive away. Paul took moms and dads and separated them from their children and had them placed in prison. Paul took children and had them separated from their moms and dads and had them thrown into prison. Paul had entire families thrown into prison. He was the source of many Christians dying in the church because he was a radical legalistic Pharisee who wanted to end the movement called Christianity. And he was responsible for a great deal of pain. Paul says, I am the least of the apostles. Who am I that God would save me through his son, Jesus Christ? Now here I want to pause, if you will allow me for just a moment. And I want to define for you what an apostle is. I would encourage you to write this in the margin of your Bible or on your notes if you were taking notes. I'm going to give you a passage of Scripture and I'm going to illustrate for you the importance of standing on Scripture. So let's look at what the Bible says an apostle is. The reference here is Acts chapter 1 and it is in verse 21. So go with me to the book of Acts. And let's look at Acts chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 21 and 22, and I want you to hear how the Bible defines an apostle. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. There are three things here that defines what an apostle is. Number one, according to these verses, an apostle was a man who was involved in the earthly ministry of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Number two, he was taught by Jesus on a regular basis. And number three, he was a witness to the resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me illustrate for you the importance of standing on Scripture. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, in their organizational structure, they are led by 12 apostles. One of them is the president of the church. Of those 12 apostles, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints gets all of their directions, all of their movement. Everything they do is driven through those 12 men. Now, the next time they come to your house and knock on your door, I would encourage you to have this conversation. I have. And they can't answer the question. This is what I said to two apostles or two men who came to my house. I said, so do I understand you that you have 12 apostles who lead your church? Yes, we do. And they're mighty men of God. Awesome. I said, but do you understand the biblical definition of an apostle? Well, yes, we do. And they told me their definition. I said, can we look at Scripture together? And so we went to this passage of Scripture. And I said, now, would you agree that they like the King James? So I pulled my King James off the shelf, and we looked at it together. I said, now, would you agree that this passage says an apostle is three things? And I went through what I just shared with you. And they said, yes, we would. I said, can you help me understand? Because I'm confused. I'm really concerned for you because the essence of, of the leadership of your church is built upon fallacy and not truth. Those men who call themselves apostles who lead your church cannot be true apostles because they were not on this earth when Jesus was doing his earthly ministry. Number two, they were not taught by Jesus himself. And number three, they have not seen the resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So would you agree you have a problem? They didn't know what to say. See, when you don't stand on the truth of God, you can be swayed to do almost anything and make the Bible say what you want it to say so you can do what you want to do. But God doesn't give us that latitude. God says you must stand on my word and live by it, doing what it says. An apostle is someone who has done earthly ministry with Jesus, been taught by Jesus, and saw the resurrected Jesus. So, with that being said, look at verse 10. But by the grace of God, Paul says, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, meaning the apostles. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Paul saw himself and is truly an apostle of Jesus Christ. But how can that be? How can he call himself an apostle? He can call himself an apostle because he was taught by the Holy Spirit of God in Arabia for two years. He saw the resurrected Lord twice. He meets all of the qualifications of an apostle. And therefore he has the right to say that he is an apostle. So notice what he says here, as we see the special testimony of one who is so humble, broken by his past, and yielded to the leadership of God. But by the grace of God, you should circle that word, you see it three times in verse 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Here it is the second time. His grace toward me was not in vain. And then you see it the third time at the end of the verse. But the grace of God that is with me. Last passage, go to Ephesians chapter 2 and look at verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2 and go to verse 8. Anytime you hear us talk about Scripture several times, but we're looking forward to it. All right, here we go. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For the grace of God, here it is. But by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one can boast. Paul is telling us that I was saved by the grace 
of the living God. I persecuted the church, and yet God still saved me through His Son, Jesus Christ. I didn't do anything to earn this. There's no way I could merit this. There's nothing I could have done that would require God to do such a thing for me. It is the gift of God, verse 9, not a result of works. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. You can never be good enough. It is the grace of God. Why? Because God knows us and he doesn't want us to boast about something that we shouldn't boast about because it's all from God and not from you. You see, we have the testimony of the church. When we walk closely with God, our community will see the evidence of Christ's resurrection and the Lord that lives in us and through us. The testimony of Scripture. Do you believe what it says? The gospel is of first importance. The Bible points to Jesus, but is that enough for you? Are you there yet? The testimony of eyewitnesses. The Bible is laden with men, women who speak to this. The testimony of a special witness, Paul describes the depth of his sin and depravity and how God would save someone like him. Is there evidence in your life in my life, that we serve a resurrected Lord? You have to answer that. You can't walk away from that. And neither can I. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I know that there is someone here today who does not have a relationship with God. I understand that. I appeal to you now. Know this. By God's grace, He offers you life in Jesus Christ. Right now, here, you can choose to become a child of the living God. You can make that decision now. Just stop moving away from God and move to God. Just fall before Him. Confess your sin to Him. He will forgive you. There's nothing special about anything I can tell you to pray other than you must pray from your heart. You must say, God, I am sorry. I am changing my mind and I'm stopped running away from you and now I'm coming to you. Would you forgive me for what I've done? What I've said? I don't know who you are. I don't know who Jesus is, but by faith and trust, I yield my life to you. Would you be my Lord now? I promise you, if you pray from the depth of your being, God will hear your voice and your prayer. He will forgive you an eternal life. Could it be yours through Jesus Christ this morning? If you pray that prayer, I'm going to ask you in just a few moments just to come down and grab me by the hand and say, Mike, I just pray to ask God to be my Lord. I would love the privilege to share with you what comes next. For those of you watching online or in the parking lot, I want to give you my telephone number. And I want to ask you, if you've prayed that prayer this morning, please call me at 903-570-2201. I would love to rejoice with you, pray with you, and then help you do what's next so that you can learn how to have a strong relationship with Jesus. For my family here in this room who already has a relationship with Jesus, is your life evidence of the presence of God? Does the gospel truth drive you? I want to ask you to consider that this morning. This altar will be open for you if you need to come down and pray. Pray where you are. But listen to the voice of God and come clean before Him. Father, in these holy moments, I pray now that you continue.